And we are with our guest of today's show, Joe Evangelisti from South Jersey. Joe, heard so much about you, man. How you doing? Thanks, Brent. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. I'm doing great. That's awesome. Well, uh, thanks again for being a guest. I know that uh, you're a busy man. You uh, are doing a lot of amazing things. And, but I uh, just, you know, sharing your time with us today. I want to start from the beginning. You've been doing this over a decade, investing in real estate. And I want you to kind of start from the beginning, man. How'd you get started and bring us up to today? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I usually start uh, uh, kind of way back because it's uh, kind of the basis of things is uh, I was always just uh, simply in construction. My, my dad um, ran, ran a drywall company when I was growing up. So back as early as I can remember, I was walking around on projects. Um, you know, my, my parents were divorced, um, you know, right after, uh, you know, I was born. So just from a very, very young age, as soon as I could walk, I, I would spend weekends with my father and, um, you know, he was kind of a seven day a week, uh, guy, you know, so, so weekends I would be walking job sites and, you know, cleaning up drywall scraps and filling the dumpster and sweeping floors. And, you That's know, I remember thing. even when I was, yeah, I mean, that was my thing, man. I actually, I actually really enjoyed it. I remember thinking it was so cool that I got the opportunity to go check out these jobs when all my friends were like doing whatever they were doing. I didn't even know because it was like me and my dad in a truck and that's, that's, uh, that was fun for me. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, I just remember being like, you know, literally as, as high as like his thigh and I would like hold on to his leg cause I was, you know, I was like petrified of like, you know, getting hurt. Um, you know, I'd walk around job sites and that's, you know, so construction has been in my blood my whole life. And, um, you know, that, that was really the basis of, uh, of where I got kicked off in the, in, in the business. Well, that's awesome. So your dad, uh, in, in construction, that's how you learned how, uh, to just to kind of swing the hammer, uh, you know, hang some drywall, things like that. My dad was also not really into construction, but he was a, he was a teacher. He was a shops teacher. So, uh, me and mm -hmm. him, we would flip some houses too. He'd be put in cabinets and I'd be seeing the floors. So we can kind of relate a little bit on that yeah. uh, with our dads, but, but take us up from there. So you got into construction. Yeah. Uh, what'd you do then? Yeah. Yeah, I worked through high school in construction, and then in fact, uh, you know, um, probably right after I graduated high school, I, I actually probably started working for my dad. Uh, well, I, I, you know, I kind of always did construction with my dad throughout throughout the high school and whatnot. Graduated high school and went to community college for like about one semester and realized I couldn't stand it. Um, and at that time, um, as I was working with my dad and, and in, in community college, um, the foreman that I was working for at his office was actually a uh, retired senior chief. Uh, in the Navy. And this guy, um, you know, was an influence in my life. And he said, you know, you could do construction in the Navy. And I was like, you know, I didn't know that was possible. I didn't know you could do that. What are you talking about? And that's when he introduced me to the U.S. Navy Seabees, um, the construction battalions of the Navy. And he was like, yeah, man, you could go do, you could be a builder in the Navy and you could fly around on planes and stay on land and work with the Marine Corps basically. And, you know, and never see a ship. And I was like, get out of here. Like, you know, I didn't think that, I didn't think I could do that, man. Like, right. like get out, you know, for real, like I could wear a uniform, I could go in the military and I could, you know, and I always had this kind of like, um, you know, thing in the back of my mind, I wanted to be in the military for some reason. I don't know where it came from, but I always just had this like calling to want to serve. And so now I was like, okay, I can do construction and serve. So I thought it was just kind of a natural fit. So, wow. um, ended up uh, joining the Navy at, at, you know, at 18 and, uh, served about six years in the CBs and, got to uh got to do all kinds of cool stuff and you know fly all over the world and learn all kinds of cool things and build all kinds of cool stuff and really got a, an amazing um not only uh experience but just taught me so much discipline and so much um you know uh so much about leadership and so much at a young age that uh you know i i literally when i popped out of the other end and i was you know about 24 years old um, you know, my maturity level at that point, I mean, I, you know, I was, I was able to accomplish uh, more than I, I know I would have at, at 24 otherwise, but, you know, it kind of gave me a good, a good head start, a good jump start in life. Um, yeah, definitely. I'm just interested in what, what are some things that you would build in, uh, in the Navy? Is it you Man. So, so, you know, it's a great question, actually. It's, uh, some of the stuff you would think it was like, wow, this is super, super duper important. Some of the stuff you'd be like, man, why is our military building this stuff? So I'll give you a good example. Um, in Japan, I built a, uh, you ever heard of a, an, it's called an LCAC. It's actually, it's a, that, that's actually the, uh, the, the synonym or the uh, abbreviation for it. But do you ever see those gigantic um, uh, um, hovercrafts 
that they're literally like like a hundred yards long, like a football field, like a, like like that the Marine Corps actually comes in on land. They so I used to I, I built a an LCAC landing pad in Japan, which was literally like like twenty football fields wide of a concrete pad, and all we did for for seven months was literally form up form work for concrete and then have it boomed in and pump concrete in. And I mean, the concrete pads we were pouring were something like 27 inches thick. And wow. so like it would take us a week to form up this one pad and then we pour it and then take the forms down and then take us another week. And so like, I mean, I, I, I've poured so many yards of concrete make you crazy, but um, <laughs> you know, that was one project. And then like another project would be, you know, to build a building out of uh, out a block. I built a random building in Guam that was for a, um, you know, for a facility that was over there, but, uh, you know, all, all kinds of different things. And, and, um, actually in 2003, I was lucky enough to, uh, to be sent over to a U.S. Central Command, and we actually were able to build out um, the uh, Ford operating base for Tommy Franks when, um, you know, he took over as a uh, commander in, uh, you know, for the war when, when we, you know, when we invaded Baghdad. So um, I was actually over there building out his Central Command Center at the time for uh, for that. So, you know, we did, not only did we, you know, do some mundane concrete projects and stuff like that, but we also got to do some super cool stuff as well that, um, you know, it's probably a little bit more, uh, you know, it's, uh, what, what would I call it? Uh, maybe sensitive that I can't talk about, but you know, very, very cool things. Um, but just everything construction related that you can think of, you know, the CVs can do it. In fact, in fact, their motto is, uh, you know, um, the difficult takes a week and the impossible takes a little longer, you know? So if there's, if there's anything that could be done uh, in construction, the CVs will get it done. And wow. uh, so it was a great experience. That's cool. Well, thank you so much again for your service. That sounds like you learned so much uh, discipline and you came out 24 years old and uh, you had had all of those experience in construction. So you come out, what's the next step? Yeah. So from there, I actually, um, because I had a top secret security clearance at the time, I was offered this job that was just way over my head um, at the Defense Intelligence Agency down in D.C., in Washington, D.C., uh, as a project manager for a big construction operation. And um, I started doing that right off the bat. You know, they just dropped me in and they were like, here, you're in charge of this, uh, this massive construction job, um, fitting out these, uh, these um, basically they call them cubes, but it would be like a whole floor. Uh, of the agency and you know the, the, the agency is built is made up of these like seven different buildings that range between five five stories and seven stories and uh, Essentially we were going through one by one each level and they were just eradicating the whole story the whole floor You know going concrete to concrete and just building all new floors So um, and every time we finished one they would go to another floor and another building and they would wipe one out and do it all over again so um, they dropped me in one of those and said, you know, here's your floor. And, uh, you know, so from day one, I was took, took over on one of those projects and, uh, I was there for about a year and a half and I probably would still be there, uh, if it wasn't for my wife. So I met my wife at some point during that time who was from New Jersey and, uh, she almost immediately moved in with me down in DC. And, uh, we had this amazing apartment in this amazing part of the city and, uh, we drove back and forth to New Jersey every single weekend because she has to be close to her mom uh, at all times. So um, after that happened for a couple months, I said, this is enough. We need to get back to New Jersey. And we basically packed up and moved home, um, which is cool because that, that, that really sparked the whole, you know, where I'm at today and having the businesses and all that kind of thing. Or I'd probably still work for that company because it was an yeah. amazing job. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, I'd love to, to bring us up to speed here. So uh, yep. something happened. Uh, along the way, you get back to Jersey and you got mm -hmm. the bug for real estate investing, flipping properties. You already knew a little bit about uh, a lot about construction, obviously, because you've been doing mm -hmm. it along with you and your dad and, and the, the Navy. So how'd you get into investing? Yeah, so we just got the, you know, I got the bug and I got it at the, uh, you know, probably the most inopportune time. Um, we bought our first house in 2007 and uh started flipping it because that time right everybody's flipping houses it's the it's the cool thing to do um you know i don't even think there was that many um uh, house flipping shows on tv yet but there, there were at least for one or two right mm -hmm. um and you know i got myself a mentor and um i jumped into it both feet and we bought a house and you know we did it the traditional way at first uh, you know i i put uh, i had a partner um and we put 25 percent down we bought it with a bank we did traditional financing and um, we flipped it by hand. You know, we did it nights and weekends. It took us like 12 weeks. 
Um, literally, I did all the carpentry stuff, the paint, the drywall, the cabinetry, the trim, um, you know, you name it. And then he did all the utility stuff. So he did the HVAC and the plumbing and all that. Um, and, and we did a great job. We flipped it and we got caught right in the middle of that, that kind of softening. Um, not, not quite the implosion yet, but everything started softening, right? Um, but luckily for us at that time, we were kind of smart enough to have more than one exit strategy. So, um, you know, we saw the market start to soften and we said, okay, let's just put a tenant in here and refinance. Um, so that's what we did. We put a tenant in refinance, but we didn't get all of our money back, right? We didn't have the BRR method. We weren't smart enough to know how to do all that. So we refinanced, but we, we had our, um, you know, our initial cash stuck in that, in that project. Um, so then we jumped into the next one and we did the next one. And, you know, again, I'm 24 years, 25 years old at this point and, you know, uh, that was a lot of money for me. I mean, I had all my life savings that I had made to this point kind of stuck in the first two houses. So I got through the second house and, and the same thing happened. We had to rent it. And at that point, there's really the kind of a, one of those first light switches that went off. And I said, I have to figure out a better way to do this. And that's really when I learned um, the whole strategy of private money and learning how to raise private money and learning how to be um, you know, smart about it and respectful of other people's funds and, and making sure that, you know, uh, we did the right thing and we were conservative and, you know, all those things that, that make up, um, you know, uh, good, good private money deals where it's a win-win and so forth. But um, after those first two deals, uh, we've never, you know, we've never not used private money since uh, to make, to make these deals happen. And we've done, you know, knock on wood, you know, hundreds and hundreds of deals since then. And, uh, you know, uh, most of them have been very successful. So, yeah. you know, I think that's, I think it's huge. Uh, obviously you got into private money and uh, a lot of people sometimes don't even know they've heard of hard money. They've heard mm -hmm. of traditional bank money, uh, private money, <clears throat> a little bit different. Uh, maybe you can explain that a little bit. And I want to spend the next sure. five or six minutes talking about, you know, how do you do that? Because obviously if you're able to do that, it brings so much opportunity because you already have the construction background. You already know what you're doing there. Uh, if you learn how to find a good deal, that's obviously, um, you know, a technique that you need to do, but the, but the money is just such a huge piece and it holds 95, 99% of the people back because they just don't know how to yeah. do it. So, so let's spend some time. What is private money and how, what are the best techniques to go about uh, raising private money? I know that you're, just an expert on this topic. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of funny. You said that, that I go back to your first thing you said is uh, what's the difference between private money and, and, uh, and hard money. It's, it's funny. You, you kind of said that because I did private money for probably five, six, seven years before I actually knew what hard money was like, like it's mostly the other way around, right? Most people are in that hard money game before they're like, what's private money. I didn't know what that was like. And so, and, and, and you know, we're both pretty well versed with this and I'll kind of give my explanation and you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, like it, the hard money is way more institutional, right? So that's when you're talking basically, you know, full underwriting, mostly an appraisal. There's going to be a lot of fees. There's going to be a lot of processing. And, and again, I've only, I've only done hard money once um, and, and learned kind of the, the hard way that I, it's not something I'm, that we're, that we're very interested <laughs> in. Like hard. Um, it was kind of like, it's kind of like I, I put my foot in the water and I was like, Nope, this is way too cold for me. I'm not going back in. Um, uh, and, and so, uh, private money is, is, is exactly what it sounds. It's, it's literally people dealing with people, um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis and utilizing their private cash. And, um, I guess I kind of fell into it backwards. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I always tell the story of how I did it. And then really, I've never done it in any way different kind of since then. Um, I initially, um, and this goes back, you know, probably over 10 years, obviously, because that's when we did that, that third deal. Um, I was actually in a conversation with somebody who um, was a kind of a friend of a friend who was starting a tax lien company at the time. And now that tax lien company is worth, I mean, they, they're probably, they're on, they're on like their fourth or fifth round of funding and they're raising a hundred million for their fifth round. So God knows how much they've raised in total, but, but I mean, this is a huge, huge company. And I met that, I met, I had lunch with him and I said to him, um, you know, what would you do if you were me? You know, if you were me and you had deals, um, which, which is the second piece of advice, you always start with the deal, right? I think, I think, you know, I think it's pretty common advice, but I think it's not always followed, right? If you find the deal, the money will follow. 
right? So you have to find a good deal. If you go to somebody hat in hand and have no deal, then you have no opportunity and the money's not going to be there because you have no opportunity. So you have to first and foremost know what you're looking at and have a deal in order for money to show up, right? So, so that's, that's number one. But I always go and I ask for advice. And I think if you ask for advice, you're lucky that you're, you're likely going to find money. If you ask for money, you're likely going to get advice, right? Yes. So, so my, my first deal, I, I asked this, this guy who I knew that, that had raised a ton of money himself. And, and by the way, this first guy I, I asked for advice pretty much could have wrote me the check. I'm confident could be an investor um, at, that, at that time. Um, and so he said, you should talk to one of my investors who just invested in my fund. I think he would do this with you. Uh, I went and had lunch with that guy. The first thing that guy did after I asked him for advice, he tried to put me in front of his bank, right? Mm -hmm. um, again, 25 years old, no credit, no background, flipped two houses, right? I knew it was a, it was a total crapshoot to sit in front of this bank. I knew it was never going to fly, but I thought, what do I have to lose, right? So I sat in front of the bank. I got shot down, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was embarrassing. It was a shot to my ego at the time. I thought to myself, why wouldn't this bank take this deal? But guess what? After that meeting with the bank, that guy lent us our first deal mm -hmm. and he sent it and he gave us our money. And, and since then we have done literally, I mean, we've done hundreds of deals with that particular guy uh, and his partners because from that point forward, not only did he lend us his money, but he went out and got all of his buddies to put their money together and they lend us their money. And, 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 it's, it's, it's become an amazing relationship. And we've, we've made them millions of dollars of interest over the last decade um, through that one lunch, through that one I wanna, referral lunch. I want to ask you a question on that. So yeah. why, why do you think that he put you in front of his bank? Why do you think he did that? And why didn't he just say yeah. that? Yeah. That's a great question. I, you know, I, I think at that time, he was probably looking to see how I performed in front of his bank. I think he was trying to kind of make it a little bit of a show to see, you know, what kind of integrity I had about that deal. I mean, the bank literally wanted to see me give them a presentation on the deal. So maybe he was trying to see what I would, you know, what I would do and, and how I would handle the pressure. Um, I think some people, you know, might have said like, oh, I'm not comfortable with that and not done the deal, you know. So I, I kind of, you know, in a way I was playing along. Um, but in a way, in the back of my mind, I thought to myself, this isn't going to fly. You know, it's, I, know, I know the bank's going to say no, you know, um, but I don't, I don't know. You know, to this day, I, not only are you the first one to ever asked me that question, I've never even thought about that question. So that's a great question. I'm just I wondering. Know. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, there could be a lot of reasons. Yeah. Be, number one, uh, I always, so, so my biggest pet peeve in my business, I tell my team all the time is just, just show up. If you just show up each and every day, yeah. work really hard then I think that you'll be able to be successful. Maybe you're not the most talented person, but I think if you just show up, that's like 90%. And I think maybe that mm -hmm. was part of it. He's like, he, maybe he was just interested to see if, if you would actually do it. He's like, just show up. No, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, no, no in hindsight, I think that's what I'm thinking. And, and uh, no, I like that, just show up. I, I, say, I say something that's pretty similar to that, which is you just have to be open to opportunity. So, you know, if I'm in front of a person at that level, who I know can loan, who I know just did a major investment in this other guy, right? And he says, hey, I think you should X, short of doing something illegal or, or super embarrassing, I'm, I'm gonna do that thing, you know? <laughs> like, like if, it's, if it sounds like sound advice and it's not dangerous, then why wouldn't I, right? So if the guy says, let's go talk to my banker, he must, he must have a reason for it, right? Yeah. So I guess that's, that's what we did. Um, you know, and, so, and, and after that, we did a deal. That's awesome. So this guy, uh, you got to deal with him. You've, and, and this happens all the time, right? So private money yeah. is private individuals. You do one deal, it turns out to be successful. So again, yeah. they put their money back in play. Uh, and yeah. that's what's happened. Plus he's brought friends to the table. Is there any other advice? So one thing I kind of got from the conversation was don't ask for money, ask mm -hmm. for advice. So pick people in your sphere that have been able to raise money and ask them how they would do it. Is there any other advice yeah. that you would give on raising uh, private money? Yeah, when you're talking to people who are capable of lending, don't ask them about the particular deal. Ask them what they're trying to get out of it. Like what is, what, like, so it's just like talking to, to a seller, for example. You're not, if you talk to, if you had a seller on the phone, the obvious first question is not gonna be, uh, hey, this is uh, this is uh, Happy Home Buyers. How much do you want for your house? 
right? It's not the first thing you go for, right? I think a lot of people, when they're talking about investments, it's like, well, how much do you want in return for your money? Like, that's not the concept. It's rapport, right? So, so I'm trying to find out from people, you know, what is, you know, what's the current status? What are you doing right now with it? You know, what's the ultimate goal? What are you trying to create? You know, is it, is it retirement money? Is it cash? Is it something you need access to? Um, is it, is it super important to you? I, I don't want to borrow money that from people that they need to live off of this money, right? I mean, obviously you want to deal with people that have, uh, you know, the means to, to be able to lend. Uh, I'm always, I'm always very open with the fact that it's a risk, right? I mean, knock on wood, we've never had, we've never been even one day late on a payment. But the fact is that guys, we invest in real estate. So you have to be very thorough in, in understanding that there's a risk involved in an investment, right? Um, I think that you have to be hyper, hyper aware that you need to be, um, make sure that that investment that you're taking responsibility of it. And then you have more than one exit strategy. And then, you know, what happens if things go wrong? Like, I'm always talking to investors like that. You understand, like if they say, you know, be prepared for them to say, well, what happens if things go wrong? I, I'm open to that conversation, you know. So, so I think that if you're if you're prepared for those things, then people are going to be a lot more confident um, in having that conversation with you. Don't be don't be um, you know thrown off guard if, if if people are having those conversations because it's it's their right to to un, you know to have those conversations, ask those questions, right? They yeah. should want to ask those questions. I would, you know, if yeah. I was investing. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I think that's, that's awesome. Just building the rapport with the person and just like motivated sellers, it's all about following up with the person and, and don't always be asking again about, Hey, how much do you want? How much uh, is the return? Uh, but just yeah. asking about them, what do they need? It has to be a win-win. And it's kind of like the motivated seller game, right? That's what we're talking about. We get, sometimes you got to just talk to them five, six times. They're not on the first phone call. They're not gonna say, Oh yeah, here's, here's a hundred K, you know? Whatever. I call it situational awareness, Brett. Like it's not, it's not the number or the return necessarily. Sometimes it's how often they get paid. Sometimes it's, you know, they want to get paid up front for some reason. Some of them want monthly income checks so they can just live off of that residual. Some people want the money at the end, you know? So like the situational awareness is understanding all of the things that are happening in that relationship and why it's important to them to find a good place for it. Sometimes they just don't want to deal with their broker. Sometimes they don't want to think about it. They just want a fixed rate of return. Some of, some people are stressed out over stocks. They're, they're worried about that, that constant back and forth. You know what I mean? Like understand the people that you're investing with and truly, and, and this is the exclamation point, like truly care, right? You have to truly care. When you care, they can sense that, right? You have to care about people's money more than your own. Mm -hmm. And when you do, it'll come through. Yeah. Did you feel that you had to pay more, uh, better returns to the investor, uh, higher rates of return at first than you do now because uh, you're a lot more experienced. Uh, what would somebody expect, you know, if they've done a couple of deals like you did, uh, are they going to have to pay if they said, oh, you know, 15% interest or whatever, I don't know. Um, so I'll tell you a funny story about that. My first deal that I did with this gentleman that I'm telling you about, um, my first deal with him, we made an agreement that I would pay him um, Thirteen and a half percent and twenty percent of the profit. Okay, mm -hmm. it was a six-month loan. We did the deal so fast that his internal ROI was forty-five percent on his money. <laughs> wow. Okay, when I gave him his check, he was embarrassed to take it. Now this is going back ten years. He still tells everyone this story, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> he was embarrassed to take the check. He wouldn't take it. Okay. We had lunch a week later. He gave me back a check for $5,000 and said, you have to take this. I can't take this much money from you. At lunch <laughs> a week later, I took the $5,000 check. I ripped it up and I gave it back to him. Okay. <laughs> he tells every person who ever meets him and I that that story verbatim for the last 10 years. Well, no okay. wonder all those buddies came. <laughs> so tell me that wasn't the best $5,000 investment I've ever made in my life. Right. Yeah, so, great. so here's the thing, like people like are always like, well, you, and I say people, I mean, people who are new at this, who are trying to get into their first deal. Like it's the cost of, of building relationships. Mm -hmm. I think in your first couple of deals, you should be doing them for free. If it's, if it, what, if it's what it takes to get the experience, the relationships, the team built, look, uh, you give up whatever you have to, to get the right people on your side in those first couple of deals. You yeah. know, I, I could have made so much more money in my first couple of deals 
if I was greedy about it. But I wouldn't be where I was today if I, if I had done that, right? Yeah. That 5,000 that I gave back to him, I mean, God, he, he made 15,000, 25,000 more than he should have or that he's ever had since that day. And by the way, after that first deal, he's never taken equity again. And I've never given equity to anybody ever since that one deal that we did. So <laughs> now, now we pay anywhere between eight and 12%, depending on who's in the deal and then who's you know part of the deal and all that kind of thing, right? Um, but, but we've never given equity on a deal ever since. And he's been embarrassed to ever ask for equity since because of that, of that transaction, because of the way that that deal went down. That's a good learning lesson. I love that investing uh, in relationships, you know, because just think, yeah, if that you could have made some different decisions on that and uh, you could have lost out on hundreds of deals, right? Over the hundreds. Next years. Yeah. Hundreds. So, that's awesome. Well, yep. uh, that, that's great. That's, that's some great advice on raising money. So if you're listening to the show, we're talking to Joe Evangelisti and we're talking about raising capital. We're going to talk about something else just real quick, but go to our show notes right now, simplewholesaling.com forward slash episode 192 and uh, all of the information in the show is going to be in the show notes. Uh, Joe, you've been able to teach and mentor brand new students or even people that are experienced. Uh, and I feel like um, that people sometimes get hung up on just trying to do it all themselves. And I know for me personally, I've been doing it for 12 years. So I got into it 07, 08, um, very similar to you. And I was me and my dad actually got into business and we kind of did it ourselves for the first seven years. And then I started scaling a team. Uh, what do you see out there? Why do people do that? Right. Why do, why do people <clears throat> feel like they have to do everything from, I mean, I remember I was up at midnight sanding floors, putting in cabinets and painting and doing all these little things. And I, I would ask myself, what, what am I doing? What, what the heck am I doing? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, but I see that time and time again, and they're afraid to step out and to be the visionary of the company and to delegate. Uh, and, but you've helped people overcome some of that. So can you kind of take us through that process a little bit and how people can, can transform into the, to the owner, right? The CEO so they can run a real company. So <clears throat> I think you nailed, you nailed it there. And when you said that word afraid, Right. I think a lot of people, they live in scarcity for a long time and they get stuck in it. Um, and and people that we, we get we get live in that fear cycle. Right. Um, and, and, and I kind of I kind of regress for a second. Um, you know, statistically, most small businesses in America, I don't know what the stat. I think the stat is like 85 percent within two years fail, something like that. Eighty five percent of small businesses within two years fold. Um, I. I you know, I don't know if there's any science behind this, but I, have a, I am of the mindset that the reason behind that is because they, they get stuck in the ownership, in the, I'm sorry, in the operator space, right? They don't progress past that. I have to be the owner. I have to be the operator. I have to do everything myself. I can't, I can't expand. I can't delegate. I can't, I can't give away any of the responsibility. I can't let go of the vine. And, and so the, the business literally lives and dies by them. And so really it's not a business. Right. It's, it's just a, it's a job. And if you're lucky, it's a high paying job for a lot of people. It's not even a high paying job. It's really just a, it's, a, it's a thousand hour a week responsibility. That's not probably paying you as much as you could if you just went and got a, a regular job. Right. So, and then and that's the unfortunate truth for a lot of small businesses in America. It just really is it's the fact. And, and and I say that from talking and knowing even some of my, my family, some of my close relatives, you know, have lived this way for a long time and it's unfortunate, but it's the, it's the truth. It's the facts. Right. Um, so, so how do we, how do we get past all that? Um, you know, uh, one of my, um, one of my good friends, judge Graham uh, wrote a book called scaling with speed and in his book, which I really love. Um, and then I don't think enough business owners do this. Um, he talks about starting with the end in mind. And I think this mindset is something that, that is really going to change uh, or really could change the game for a lot of people in the business, especially in that operator mindset that are kind of stuck there. Um, because he talks about whether or not is your business is considered a lifestyle business or an enterprise business. Like, did you get into this business to just create, you know, a business that you have to be plugged in and you're, and, and that's a lifestyle business, which basically means your life is the business, right? And, and it's not going to operate without you ever. And that's okay. Like, you know, you just kind of, 
you've kind of decided that that's the way it's going to be. Uh, and, and, you know, there's no end goal, there's no sale, there's no way to get out of it. You know, when you decide one day that you've had enough, you're just going to kind of close the doors uh, and you're going to walk away. And that, and that is what it is, right? Or are you going to build an enterprise business that can actually operate, create revenue, um, you know, generate something, especially recurring revenue would be ultimate, right? And something that's saleable, something that, you know, is not, you know, the Joe Evangelisti company that's operated by Joe Evangelisti, that if Joe Evangelisti doesn't show up at 8 a.m. on Monday morning, the doors don't get unlocked, right? You, you, if you want an enterprise business, you have to decide right now or, or when you start it. And by the way, you can make that shift at any point, right? But I think a lot of people get stuck in the fear of making that shift. Like, what's it take to make that shift? It's very uncomfortable. And I use that word because it's a good word, right? I, 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 we, I like to face fear, face that uncomfort, like chase it, right? Sometimes I think that people, you know, shy away from that discomfort because they're like, you know, it's human nature, by the way, to stay comfortable. We all want to like, you know, wrap ourselves in a, in a nice blanket, lay on the couch and watch TV, right? That's, that's kind of like, you know, our nature. But the reality of it is if you want to stay healthy and you want, it, you want that six pack abs and you want to run around the beach and look good in the summer, like that's not the place to get it, right? We all know that we're supposed to eat healthy and go to the gym. Like that's discomfort. It's the opposite. It's the same thing in your business. If you want the enterprise business that's going to sell for a lot of money, that's going to operate on its own, that's going to create a lot of revenue, that's going to create um, time and freedom for you, well, then you got to be uncomfortable. You got to get, you got to face that fear. You got you to do things that maybe make you feel a little bit uncomfortable because the outcome has a much, cha much higher chance of being successful. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's the same time and effort. That's the difference, right? The same time and effort has to go into both of those two things, but you got to decide which one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I love that. And I think that you hit the, the nail on the head too, just, just kind of being afraid. And as I said, and God bless my dad, and he was a teacher for 33 years, but we were partners for the first six, seven years. And then he kind of went in more retirement, but um, we kind of had different mindsets when it came to the different things like hiring people, for example, he always considered it. Why would I pay that person when I can just do it? I'll just head over there and, you know, yeah. hammer it in or whatever. And, but, I'm, but it's just the time it's like, well, mm -hmm. why not? I'm always like, well, why, why would I want to, to do that? Right. <laughs> why don't I, why don't I just yeah. be a person? Right. It's just a totally different mindset <laughs> when it comes yeah. to do that. Yeah. Um, so that's just, that's something I had to kind of get over and, kind of living in the, do you feel like that, you know, for you, you've grown and you've scaled a tremendous business. Uh, does it ever get comfortable for you? Do you ever wrap up in the blanket? No, I am. Stay there? I am my most scared the second I feel comfortable. Mm. So, so the second I feel comfortable, I know something's wrong. So the days where the days where I'm most on edge and I'm, and I'm trying to fix major, major problems, I know things are right. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds completely opposite of how the normal, normal people think, but you know, when, when a day or two goes by and I'm like, man, life is good. I literally go to bed scared to death. Like what's <laughs> around the corner? Like what, what am I missing? What, am, what, what's wrong? And, and I'm not, and I'm not purposefully looking for problems to create because a lot of business owners will do that. But again, you got to think this is the mindset of an owner, right? So, uh, so if you go to bed like that as an operator, you can cause chaos, by the way, if you, if you're operating, you know, actively operating a business and you're looking for problems, you will create problems. But from an owner's perspective, right, when you're outside the box looking in, um, you, want, you want to solve big problems. You, you want to find big problems to solve, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yes, when I'm, when I'm comfortable, even for a day, uh, like something's, something's up. Yeah, yeah. All right. That's good. That's awesome. I love that. Well, hey guys, for tuning in, we're talking to Joe Evangelisti and uh, we're, we're diving in and Joe, we're uh, getting a little bit short on time. So any other words of advice to those new investors out there uh, before we go in the next section of the show? No, I mean, if you're new, you just keep taking action. If you haven't done it yet, find a way to take action. I think there's a, there's a, so many people I get hit up constantly all week long message, inbox, email, um, you know, Facebook, it's, it's, it's always, what do I do to start? 
uh, what you do to start is start. So, you know, don't, don't let, don't let your, um, you know, self doubt hold you back. Um, you are no different. You are no less of uh, of, a, of a person or anything else that, 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 and every other investor out there that's actually doing it and being successful. Um, you have the tools, you have the ability. Uh, the only thing between you and success is, is your, your, your ability to, uh, to be brave and go after it. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really great advice. And it kind of reminded me, my wife and I just got back from Mexico and we were doing a, a 5K. And uh, I haven't ran a 5K in a little while. I run a little bit here and there, but I do other workouts instead. But anyways, the guy, we were just stretching. He's like, all right, here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. And then I like wasn't even ready, but I just started running. And I think that's what you have to do in business. It, it's like you don't yeah. really have time to think about it. Just just get going. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and, awesome. and what happens is things are thrown at you so fast that you just get used to making huge decisions. Yeah. You know, you start out making hundred dollar decisions and the next thing you know, you're making thousand dollar decisions. Next thing you know, you're making hundred thousand dollar decisions and, and it, they're not any different. Mm -hmm. The time, like I said, the time and effort is not any different. It's just the zeros change. It is so, true. you know, it's just, it's the same thing. You just got to start taking action and stuff changes dramatically. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Great advice, Joe. I appreciate that. And that's uh, a time of the show that we're like uh, going to go into the part that we like to call going deep. And uh, so, Joe, I want to talk about you do some education and you do uh, some podcasts. So, so talk about that a little bit and why you decided to to do that and give back. Yeah. So. Um you know, I really attribute uh, most of my success it to getting involved at a much higher level with um, with mastermind groups and, and and traveling and and events and things like that. You know, um, I built my business to a certain level uh, up until about six or seven years ago, and then I just kind of plateaued and I got super stressed and burnt out and and just didn't didn't know where to turn um, until I finally got involved at a high level with. Uh, like I said, with a mastermind group. And so um, after a few years of being with that group, um, I, I finally kind of got this calling to to give back and start to do it on my own. Um, so about three years ago, um, maybe a little bit more at this point, I, I started doing it on my own. I started my own mastermind group. I started doing events. I started coaching and mentoring. Um, and I, you know, I do it out of, out, of, um, out of my passion for knowing what it does or what it's done for me. Um, and you know, I think that in our space and, you know, Brad, I think you can attest to that, uh, to this is, is there's, there's so many, unfortunately people who coach and mentor and do all these things that just have, have no, uh, experience in the business or, or very little, and just probably shouldn't be in the space doing these things. Um, you know, whereas there's, there's a handful of people that, that have a ton of experience doing these things and, um, these deals and, and should be actively out there doing it. And I'm not putting any bells down, by the way, I'm not trying to, but you know, I think that if you're actively in the business and you're running a business and you're running a wholesale team, like my team is in the other room, right. Um, you know, there's, there's some people out there that, that can help, uh, you know, guide you, uh, grow you, um, help push you to another level and, uh, you know, mentor your business to another place. And so, um, you know, I've been fortunate enough to, uh, to have the time available to, to help people grow, help them learn, um, and really, um, push their mindset because in reality, that's, that's one of the biggest factors that happens in this, in, in these type of groups, right? Is just getting your mindset to a whole other place, getting you think, thinking at a different level, getting you, um, you know, you know, that uncomfortable thing that we keep talking about, right? Like getting comfortable with the uncomfortable and then making that uncomfortable, you know, so um, getting yourself to continue to push um, to a bigger place and a higher place um, is really um, what a lot of these groups do, keeping the accountability factor in play and, uh, and, and helping you uh, push to a higher level. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Uh, I'm part of a mastermind, a couple mastermind groups actually. And uh, yeah, I tell people all the time, it has helped me just immensely uh, build confidence. Uh, it's helped us double our business in a year. Um, and it's just, just kind of helps you break through the ceiling, I think is a big thing. Yeah. So you hit that plateau and you're like, how do I, how do I bust through? And you're just going to have that at different stages, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that doesn't go away. So that, that's awesome. So one last question in this is uh, talk to talk about your family, your, your why, um, 
where do you see yourself being personally in the next 10 years, man? Yeah, man, I don't know where I'm going to be in three, three years. I mean, I, you know, I always, I always talk about, um, you know, in, in our, in our meetings and our events, I always say like, you know, if, it, if people at our level, um, you know, they, they evolve every six months, you're almost a different person, right? Like if you can reflect back on where you were six months ago, uh, you know, um, faith, family, fitness, friends, and finances, like every one of those things should be at a level where they're almost unrecognizable, maybe six, nine months ago. And so, um, you know, and, and that's kind of how I do my, you know, quarterly kind of reflection, like where am I growing in those levels and where am I, where am I kind of, you know, multiplying, am I multiplying in those places? Um, you know, so three years from now, I mean, man, I mean, it's going to hopefully be in a stratosphere that I'm not even, not even remotely comfortable talking about right now. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think that, um, you know, uh, you know, you asked about my why, I mean, obviously, you know, my, my, my kids, I have two little girls, they just turned seven and 10. Um, I have, I have a wife and I have a, a three dogs in the house. Um, family is always uh, super, super important, but I think bigger than that, um, it's really just impact. You know, um, one, one of my, you know, passions right now um, is building joint venture businesses and, and creating real lasting uh, partnerships with, with just amazing operators that I know, um, you know, impact creates impact, right? So, you know, when I think about, <clears throat> excuse me, like my why, uh, it's really, it's about, you know, leaving legacy that, you know, uh, whatever, you know, something maybe I teach today to somebody is going to affect some, somebody's grandchild that, that doesn't even know who I am, you know, 50 years from now because of something I taught them and helped them create today, you know, that helped them create something else, you know, so it's that, it's that ripple effect that I think that, you know, potentially that we're creating right here on this podcast, you know what I mean? Like, to me, that's, that's what gets me excited. That's what gets me, you know, juiced up to go out and, and do this stuff every day is just the, just the amazing, the, I mean, the technology allows us to go out there and create this, this, uh, this content of, you know, um, this ability to distribute great content, right? And, and hopefully um, create real impact to people that, that need it. And hopefully they go out there and take action. And, and if you're listening to this, that's what it's all about, right? Like Brett and I are not just here talking heads, trying to uh, keep you guys entertained, right? It's all about going out there and actually implementing some of the stuff and taking real action and then message us and tell us how it worked because that's what it's all about. That's right. Cause we're not that smart either. Are we Joe? <laughs> no, we're really not. And there were no different than you. I swear. <laughs> God, definitely. No, great advice, man. And uh, yeah, wish you all the success. I think that's, that's amazing. Um, you know, just raising that legacy. And, and I know that you have a couple of podcasts that I also want to mention here at the end of the show as well. Uh, yep. If you're listening out there, definitely want you to tune into those and all of our show notes are going to be, I'm going to put that book in there too, Scaling with Speed. I've not read that one and I'm definitely it's going great book. To, uh, to put that in the show notes as well. Scaling with Speed at simplewholesaling.com forward slash episode 192. And Joe, thanks again, man. And we're going to end today's show with just some fun, fun questions for you. So this is called the touch of randomness. So I've created three uh, random questions for you. So then the first thing that comes to your mind, don't have to take it too serious or anything like that. But number one, describe your life in one sentence. Mm. Make a big impact. I like that. I like that. Number two, who from your past do you wish that you would have stayed in contact with? Living or dead? Either. My uncle. How come? My uncle passed away about two years ago. And uh, he was a big influence in my life. Awesome. All right, number three, what is the best way to spend a rainy afternoon? Uh, for me, it's reading. I just like, I like uh, sitting in my office and reading if it's raining. Awesome. What book yeah. are you reading right now? Uh, I just got done The Big Leap. That's another really good one. Um, one of my friends randomly uh, sent it over to me, and I, I, I listened to it on audio last week. It was awesome. Um, never heard of it before then, but it was a really, really good book. Just check that out, too. Awesome. Big leap. Great. Big leap. Yeah. 
going to put that in there as well. So awesome. Well, thank you so much, Joe, for being on the show and awesome stuff, uh, amazing wisdom that you provided. And again, um, your podcasts, and I don't know if you have one, I know you have yep. one, but, um, what are the links to those? Yeah, we used to have the, we used to have the, uh, the flip King real estate show. Uh, we actually transitioned into the legacy blueprint podcast which is active now um actively we're dropping shows every week so uh yeah feel free to check us out there and uh, leave us a review if you listen to it awesome and if someone's more uh, interested in your education just reaching out to you where's the best place for them to go yeah we're super active on uh, facebook and linkedin and of course you guys can check us out at joeevangelisti.com if you subscribe there you'll get a weekly newsletter from me which uh, gives you all kinds of updates and all kinds of free downloads as well each week great and you guys can check those out again at simplewholesaling.com forward slash episode 192 and that's a wrap with joe evangelisti thank you so much joe and god bless you man thanks for having me man